standing by. Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to yet another spectacular northeast South African dawn. The grey dawn light has given way to gentle hues of orange and yellow here. A wind blows from the east unusually and we're sitting here at the hyena den where we're hoping to see the mother, Gwendoline, bring her two little cubs out. Unfortunately, neither cubs nor mother seem to be in attendance. Now, you are on a live safari, in case you were wondering, from the iconic Kruger National Park, the western fringes thereof. We're on a little spit of land called Juma, private game reserve. My name is James. On camera today we have... Brian, the thumb, Joubert. Brian, what was the thumb this morning? Oh, just the suit and tie. Suit and tie for Saturday. Mm -hmm. Very nice, suit and tie Saturday. And on the other vehicle, currently without signal, the uh, elegant antelope that is Jamie Patterson, and she's being filmed by um, the, well, I wouldn't describe him as an elegant antelope, Viam Durenbrach. He's got a very long thumb, though, and that is very elegant of him. Now, we are going to do some well, various things today. We're going to sit here for the next two minutes, and then we're going to head down towards the south, where the great queen, Karula, 12-year-old female leopard, and her two baby cubs, who turn five months old today, are apparently have been knocking about on the road during the night. Herbert is out there tracking them, and we're going to go and give him a hand. Please do talk to us over the course of the next three hours. It's always so nice to hear from you. Give us your comments and questions, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. You can ask us about what we're seeing. You can comment on what you'd like to see. You can tell us about your bird lists. You can ask us about Africa and South Africa and potentially traveling to this area. There are a number of ecotourism lodges, the properties of which we traverse. Cheetah Plains off to the east where Jamie's hoping to go once she's got some signal and Arethusa to the west so send us any questions you'd like about that ask us about the seasons, the weather, what it feels like to live here the smells, the sounds, anything you like it'll be good to talk to you over the next three hours especially if the number of animals that we have here at this hyena den persists I hope it won't Hello Caroline you're asking if it's winter in this at, in Africa at this time of the year. Well, um, Caroline, good question. It is winter in South Africa at the moment, but it's not winter all over Africa. Now, remember, Caroline, that Africa uh, is three times the size of the continental United States. That means that it straddles both sides of the equator. So there's a northern hemisphere where it's summer now, it's the same as it, same as it is with you in the United States. And, or, well, I think I'm assuming you're in the United States. You could be in Scandinavia, for all I know. Uh, but half of Africa is north of the equator, and the other half is south of the equator. So the bits of it that are south of the equator, it's winter here. So the iconic areas of South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, Mozambique, we're all having winter now. And then in North Africa and into sort of equatorial Africa, like the northern reaches of Uganda and Kenya and into uh, well, Egypt and the Sudan, well, it's blazing summer there at the moment. The equatorial regions, I guess, pretty uniform uh, climate all year round, Rwanda, Burundi, all those sorts of areas in the Congo Basin. So Africa is a massive, massive place. That's exactly the kind of question that we encourage you to ask. Thanks very much for that, Caroline. There are no hyenas here. Let's go and see if we can find a leopard. Is that a good idea, Brian? It's a oh, good. I'm so glad you agree. Tally, tally, ho. Tally, tally, ho, ho. <laughs> it's about 14 degrees here at the moment, which, if memory serves me correctly, is around... That's not too cold, the winter, and I mean, I actually feel quite toasty in my, in my jacket, and you can see that I have yet, yet to... It's not because I'm tough, it's because I don't have flesh on my legs, and therefore uh, they don't feel the cold. But it really has not been a very cold winter, and Brian and I were just discussing the fact that we both think the winter will probably last a bit longer, given the fact that it's been relatively mild 
and I mean what we describe as cold here in the southern reaches of the African continent really cannot compare with what most of you in the northern reaches of the world uh, have to say about the cold but it has been a relatively mild winter we don't know how long that's going to last though. of course we've got another month or so of full-blown winter after that in this particular area of the country it starts to get quite warm I have not heard a peep from any form of organism if we do get signal breakup sorry about that it will just be until we're on the road what's out there Brian are you okay well done good on you stout fellow Right, there we are, on to the road. So as I was saying, I have yet to hear a bird this morning. The sun is going to peep up probably as we go down here. I'm slightly surprised it hasn't yet. Brian, why is the sun late today? Uh, cloud bank on the horizon. A cloud bank on the horizon. That would be the most logical uh, answer, wouldn't it? As opposed to the earth having reversed its trajectory, for example. Yes. Good point. I can see where it is starting to glow in the east there. I'm just going to drive a little bit more quickly because we'll get on to quarantine clearings then, which is a nice high point, and we'll see the Sorry about that, everybody. I was just saying you should spend uh, this time of the day, I think, staring to the eastern horizon, in this case, the southeasterly horizon, and there you shall behold the great star, the orb that gives us life coming up over the horizon. That's very poetic, isn't it, Brian? Yes, it's profound. It's because it's Saturday, you see. Saturday suit day to go along with your thumbs very formal wear. Yes. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, Jamie still has no signal. So she's, she's back at the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's where we live. And for those who are confused by that, it is a, actually called the Juma Research Camp. And uh, we call that the DRC. In fact, you can see her if you want. She's worth a look, old Jamie. She's worth a listen, too. There she is. That's where we live, everybody. And <laughs> she is fixing her aerial. I'm not sure if she can hear us. Probably not. That's Viam hunched over there. There we go. Hello, Viam. Yeah. <laughs> They're just help hoping Connor will come and help them fix up the car. Oh, I'm suddenly in low range. Hang on. Right, there we go. There comes the sun. You saw the glow there. We'll just quickly pop up onto the clearings here. And watch the sun come up. I'm hoping Herbert will find Karula and her babies because it will be so nice to spend a nice morning with them. Hello, Lucy in South Bend, Indiana. You, I haven't heard from you for a little while, so nice to hear from you again. You say you've been stuck on 229 birds uh, for, a last, for the last long time, and you'd like to add to that. 229 for this area is a very good return, Lucy, and you're going to very slowly add to that. But we saw a bird yesterday, and maybe you can ask Jamie if she eventually gets mobile. Um, if she can try and find it for you. She's going to Cheetah Plains, and we saw a Temix Corsa there yesterday, which is not that uncommon. It is very uncommon. If it isn't, let's ask Jamie to show it to you. Here are some... Hello, Beef. I'm 
just want to eat. Strongly. Yeah. Because, well, they can themselves against each other's bodies. Eating away at the ticks already. Brian, the Kirk. <laughs> he also, well, I mean, imagine your breakfast was to go and sit on a buffalo and stick your head into his ear and eat out what you could find in there. I'm very pleased I'm not an ox picker. So these chaps are just lying here, chewing their cud a little bit still. Some of them are just standing, and they'll start to move around now and go and find something to eat as the sun comes up. There you can see the eastern glow. Ah, I can see the sun. Brian, I see it, I see it. There it is. Hmm. Hello, X Ranger. Very nice question from you. You say, is there or are there any local names for the sun, and are there any myths around it? Uh, well, the the local the Shangan word for sun is Jambo, which I think is a lovely name, and it's interestingly and I possibly comes from the same root. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's the Swahili word for hello. So ja Jambo is um, the sun in Shitsonga. In Zulu, it's Ilanga, which I think is a nice name. Um, myths, I don't know any local myths around it. Um, we must ask Herbert, actually, the next time we're on walk with him. Might try and do a walk this afternoon with him, we'll see. And, I, yeah, that the best, best person to ask would be him. I don't know of any local myths. Isn't that nice? I think that's really rather pretty. I might take a picture, Brian. Oh. Yes. World's the world's greatest landscape photographer will now take a picture of the sun. But that is what I was designed to do. Yes. Far more so than taking pictures of animals, which are normally rank awful. It's going to be a horrible photograph, Brian. Ah, but we now with a bit of beefy in the background, it will be quite nice. There we are. Well done. Super. Um, I think we should probably get going from here and see if we can't find that leopard. That would be good. So we'll do that as soon as I've taken my last rank average photograph. There we are. Right. Pajamas Patterson is now mobile and on her way. Let's go and say good morning to her. Good morning, and we seem to have sorted out our problems after much technical expertise. Turns out if you turn it on, turn it off and then turn it on again, it works once again. My name is Jamie, and this morning I have Viam on camera with me, and we're planning a trip to the Far East, sort of as far east as we can go, which is towards Cheetah Plains on this chilly winter's morning. Brr. Definitely got colder from where we first set out. We were well on our way towards Cheetah Plains before we realized that poor old Kirsty and Final Control had absolutely no idea we were out. And in fact, we had no signal and no picture. We seem to be up and running though, and VM's managed to do some kind of bush mechanics. I don't know what he did, but he took a piece of zebra wood and he sort of duct taped it to the antenna. Looks very, looks very fancy and it seems to be working all right. And it's amazing what you can do with some duct tape and, not duct tape, gaffer tape, sorry, gaffer tape, get it right. Some gaffer tape and a zebra wood branch. We're also on quarantine, obviously, since that is 
the main portal for all places extraordinary. Uh, apparently, I'm sure James has updated you, Herbert has found tracks for Karula's and her cub. So we're going to leave him to follow up there along with Herbert and we're going to head off to the east. Now, Kathy in Tennessee, good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering what happened to our little baby buffalo from yesterday. Well, the truth is we don't know for 100%, but the news is looking really good. I went back about an hour and a half or so after the end of the Sunrise Safari and there was nobody there. I mean, no buffalo there which could only mean really that mom stood up, she gave her baby some milk and off they wandered deeper into the safety of the block, which is fantastic news for us. It was a very difficult sighting to watch and James and I had a conversation about it and just sort of came to the conclusion that these animals are sort of endlessly more resilient than we believe them to be. So Kathy, oh, hello Zedis, trying to get you a view of them disappearing through the bushes and try and work our way around some very cold looking impala to get you another view. They're all sort of deep red and shivering and very fluffy. Let's go forward a bit we see the zebra in the morning light. Hello everybody. Good morning. got half the impala on Juma here, right outside the house that we usually live in. We've just moved out temporarily. And when it's cold like this, you can see just why they are known as red buck in Afrikaans, or rooibok. That deep red colour that they acquire. It's just like us getting goosebumps, trapping the warmth inside the coat. Isn't it amazing how much fluffier they are? You don't realize it when you look at the impala when they're all sleek in summertime. But just look at that. Unbelievably fluffed up. I wonder how Nelson is doing. The one-eyed, one-horned impala who has become something of a favorite on this, these live safaris. I haven't seen him in a while, but I'm sure he's around and about. Definitely a survivor is Nelson. And the, the impala herds are actually starting to sort of go back to normal. The large breeding herds, lots of different males and females all wandering about together. Our zebra are playing a bit camera shy. They don't want to appear on your morning safari. They're all hidden. Oh, and the drongos are making such a noise. There, our zebra. There's the stallion at the back. <laughs> Well, he's not far away from us. It's extraordinary just how well they disappear. Oh, Drongo's making a frantic noise. That's got you so worked up. There's, oh, there's one of them. Sorry, we're doing, we're doing a left and right morning safari. Here we go. There's our forktail Drongo, one of the ones that's chirping away. And making the most of the big herd movements to catch any remaining insects. Having a fantastic time. Now there we, we have a question about VM's sort of typical approach to his morning safari and Blue Butterfrog, welcome. You would like to know what, um, what snacks VM has bought on drive. And I, I hate to disappoint you, but I can't see any. VM? I'm on a diet this morning. Oh, VM's on a diet this morning. Um, that's quite sad, VM. You, did you just not have time to pack your breakfast? No. No. <laughs> VM's got it. VM knows how to do a safari. It's usually packed with, with yogurt and muesli bars and whatever else he manages to find. <laughs> and apples and fruit and bananas. What day is it today? It's Saturday. Okay, so we haven't yet got to the point where we start to, there's always a point in the week where we really start to run out of, not food, there's always food, 
I'd run out of the snack items because everybody's consumed all the bananas, apples and cereal bars during the course of the week and we have to wait for the legendary pick and pay truck to arrive with all of our supplies. Okay, shall we head on off? We'll say farewell to our lovely Impala for now. Munching on the Strychnos. Very brave of them. That's the monkey orange that they're nibbling on. Bit of a tricky thing, as we saw before. They've got to watch out for the spikes and the thorns. Make sure they protect their eyes. Actually, this is really cool. Nibbling away. <laughs> it's such a delicate process. So of course, they're only after the leaves. Unlike the elephants that will sort of put the whole stick in their mouth and chew around it. <laughs> We've got such an awesome view here. Making short work of each and every leaf on that strychnos plant. Nibble, 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 nibble. Such a quick, such a rapid process. Hey guys, is that a yummy breakfast? I can't imagine that it is. But that's just because strychnos is not one of our favorite trees. It's been responsible, I would say, for about 50% of the injuries acquired whilst driving off-road. They're very sharp and actually at one point caused severe injury to poor Eugene when he was trying to help me out of the, the art fark hole that I managed to find myself in. He was on all kinds of antibiotics and things for the scratch he had on his arm. Okay, Impalas, enjoy your breakfast. Go through nice and slowly, you don't scare them away. The interesting thing, of course, about this is that they're going to have to nibble a little bit and then move on before the tree produces, in response to being fed on, produces a huge amount of tannins that make it bitter and sort of not very nice for them to eat. Very clever little defense mechanism the trees have to make sure they're not overbrowsed. While well, we carry on our journey to the east, straight into the rising sun, we'll send you back across to James, find out what his plans are. So some very interesting uh, developments, unfortunately, on Torchwood, but I mean, that's okay. We just can't go there, but if you were a guest at Juma, you would be able to go there. Um, what we've got there is quarantine killed a warthog yesterday, and he hoisted it into a tree, but um, Mike from Cheetah Plains has just been there. He says there's another big male leopard in that area, and he's stolen the kill from quarantine. Now, who is that? Uh, Mike thought it might be Tingana, but he hasn't had a very good look. But Mvula was around there yesterday, and Mvula, we think, is quarantine's father. It's quite interesting that that situation is playing out there. So we'll keep you posted there. Beautiful, beautiful place to watch the sunrise. This, let's just have a listen. We haven't had a stop and a listen. It's so quiet, so quiet. That's a beautiful shot, Brian. Oh, thank you, James. Well, you, know, you do what you can. I do. You do a very good job of it. Yes. Very quiet, subdued dawn chorus of the morning. You can hear a crombrick going. One or two southern black tits going. Beautiful. Beautiful morning. <laughs> um, there were some lions calling earlier this morning, but nothing since about sort of half past four. Beautiful. Now, Brian was just saying to me that apparently the activity of the sun 
you know, these sort of large explosions and things are probably less than they are normally. Is that correct, Brian? Yep. And so you're not seeing the flares and that sort of thing. What a beautiful, beautiful shot that is. No sunspots. No sunspots. Sorry, Kathy in Tennessee, the game drive radio is going ballistic, I'm afraid. I missed your question. Can you go again with it, Chris? Ah, right. When does the rainy season start and do we expect a drought? Um, the rainy season, in theory, Kathy, starts uh, probably only in November. And do we expect a drought? Well, we don't know. No one knows if we're going to have a drought or not. There is a prediction that there's going to be... Um, f sort of substantial flooding in the area, and that's why the dams have been bolstered. Um, I'm not a subscriber that, or I'm one, one of those who believes that predicting the weather is slightly like playing roulette, and so to put your money on a weather prediction would be, well, silly. And so I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but chances are it will. We might have another dry winter, though, you know. It's quite possible that we'll have another very dry summer, uh, at least uh, rainy season like we did last year but remember we're a very very long way away from the from the wet season even if it does get wet and that's because our dry season of course is between sort of now well I mean April if you like but there's normally a bit of standing water around but until November we won't probably have much rain now what that means is that the landscape that we see before us it's very dry now and it actually looks a little bit like a sort of September landscape because of the drought that we've had it's now that the animals are going to start feeling the effects of the lack of rain that we had earlier on all right we're going to ease our way um, down to that in that sort of direction that is where Herbert is Sandy, a nice one from you. You say South Africa. Does it have any particular storms or sort of notable weather patterns and earthquakes, volcanoes, that sort of stuff? It doesn't, Sandy. Uh, we've got relatively stable weather, but for the fact that the rainfall, as it is in most parts of Africa, is unpredictable. And to say that there's an average rainfall in many parts of Africa is very difficult because uh, it's so variable. There, but the landscape that we're on now, one of the reasons that it is wildlife land is because it was useless for farming. And one of the reasons it was useless for farming is that the soils are not very fertile. And the, one of the reasons for that is that there has been so little volcanic activity in this part of the world for so long that much of the nutrients in the soil have been leached out. And so it really is pretty stable from a sort of tectonic point of view. The weather can be very variable. But we don't get, um, yeah, we do get floods to a certain extent, but not hugely in this area. Uh, much more in the Western Cape. Uh, they are a winter rainfall area. They get flooding there quite frequently. And then into Mozambique. Now, Mozambique is uh, right on the east. It's basically where you've been looking, 60 kilometers away, uh, 45 miles or so. And they're on the coastal plain, and they get hit by tropical cyclones that come up the Indian Ocean, and they get horrible flooding every so often. But actually, these days, yeah, it's not, it's not dreadfully um, unstable weather-wise. And certainly tectonically, the country is fine. We don't get tornadoes or things like that. You might get the odd tornado that rushes through the flatlands of the Free State on the High Felt, but not nothing else much. Nice question. All right, let's go across to Jamie and get an update from her, and I'll go and find out from Herbert what's happening with him. While James checks in with Herbert, I'm making sure to triple-double check along Twin Dams Road in case Karula decided to pop out in this direction. Seems as though she's moving about in relatively small circles at the moment. We'll keep our fingers crossed that she, we might encounter between the three of us. We should have all of the bases covered. 
And while we carry along down here, I hear that James was talking about earthquakes. And growing up in Johannesburg, you get earthquakes, but they're not so much earthquakes as because Je Johannesburg obviously is founded on gold mining. And a lot of the old tunnels are left abandoned and they start to collapse. So every now and again you get these rumblings if you're in the city center as the tunnels go down. And when I first started guiding, obviously I, I didn't grow up around rifles. I, didn't, I hadn't really fired one until I started guiding. But it's something that you really need to do. You need to learn how to shoot and to shoot accurately. It's one of the requirements to actually getting a job as a field guide. So I was in Johannesburg at the shooting range firing a, one of the larger rifles for the first time in my life. And um, as I did that, the tunnel collapsed underneath us and the whole ground rumbled. And I remember thinking, my goodness, that was most impressive. I have since learned, of course, that that was not due to me. It was entirely due to a collapsed mining tunnel. Let's just check around here carefully. I know that Karula, at least Karula's cubs like this boar bean that stands very much above everything else here and it also provides plenty of cover. Let's just check carefully that there's not little cubs hidden in here. Ooh, you'd have to have eagle eyes to spot them. Okay. All looks quiet there. Okay. No cubs as far as I can see, hidden about in the boar bean, but there is however a hornbill perched at the top enjoying the first rays of the morning sunlight. All of the animals basking a little bit at this time of year. The fun thing to watch is hornbills, they, they seem to feel the cold tremendously and if they're not perched at the top of trees searching for the first rays of the sun, they actually go to termite mounds. Now many of you know that those termite mounds are actually, the, the bits that we see are the vent system for the termite mound, that they open up and close to monitor and to maintain the temperature internally. So what that means on cold winter's mornings, if you go up to a termite tunnel and you put your hand over it, you can actually feel hot air rising. Now we're not the only ones who've noticed this, obviously. The mongoose, the hornbills, they'll all go sit and actually warm themselves up. It's like kind of putting themselves in front of a hairdryer first thing in the morning. Clever little technique. Let's head back across to James and see what he's found for you. Hello everybody, I think this is our favourite little third trunk elephant herd, if I'm not mistaken. That's the cow there with her missing third trunk and or a missing bottom third of her trunk. I've always find that it's very difficult to say that. And her youngest calf and the others, well, they may have been joined by another one. It's normally only four of them. Let me just sneak forward here. Now, we won't drive off road for them for two reasons. One, well, we're not going to in the drought in, for elephants. And two, it's very thick in there and will make a horrid noise. Let me just ease into a position where we can get a slight view of them. Not the best view, but that's just the way it is. We'll hopefully find some more. And I do love the picture of their grey bottoms going through this winter landscape. So different from the summer. And still you can hear the quietness of this morning. There's the odd babbler going... Bzz, 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 bzz of orioles going in the background and then the rustling of the elephants as they move through the bush. The Franklins are very quiet today. You can hear a few more elephants. I can hear a big herd of buffalo to the south of us. I'm sure that's south of our property. And if you want to see some more elephants, there's a herd of elephants at the Juma Pan apparently. So check out the Juma Dam cam. And that, that pan is going to become a focal point over the next few months because it is some of the only pumped clean water and the elephants are going to mass around that area. See, 
see how quickly they disappear. You can feel the wind. Can you feel the wind, everybody? Close your eyes and take a deep breath and I'll tell you what it feels like. It's cool. In fact, it's quite cold. It's coming from the same direction as the sun's just come up. But it does smell very fresh indeed, combined with the sweet honeyed leather scent of elephants. Well, that was a nice little sighting, a cameo appearance from the elephants. We're going to continue down this way towards Treehouse Dam, and we'll find out from Heberto how his tracking of Karula the Great Queen has gone. But she could be anywhere around here, so we're going to drive very slowly. Hello, Cat and Tampa. You say, yes, you finally seeing the leaves changing color and fall off, falling off the trees. And you say the coppers and yellows are so pretty. They are very pretty indeed. And it's a different kind of pretty, I suppose, from the North American uh, autumns or falls and winters where you get those uh, sort of splendid maroons and reds. We don't really get that here. They do stay green and then they die. And they go copper and yellow which is quite nice. Just keep an eye out for tracks here. She does sometimes like to go in there. There's a, a milkberry tree that she likes to sit on. Hello, Heidi in Canada. Um, you want to know how many trees there are on the Kruger Park, how many kinds of trees. I think that there are about 900 species of tree. Isn't that amazing? And that includes the little shrubs and things and the really lesser known ones and all the ones that you'll find in the sand forest, for example. But yeah, about 900 species or so. It's intimidating to even think about that number of trees in an area. In this particular area, though, we don't have anything like that. I think we've probably got about maybe two or three hundred species of trees in this area. And that includes sort of bushes and uh, shrubs and that sort of thing. Now keep an eye out for Karula the Queen. She might be on a termite mound. She might be in a tree along with her littlies. She might be walking them along the road. Hmm. Joan in Washington. Well, we're talking about leopards and trees, of course. You want to know if I've ever seen a lion climb a tree and take a kill from a leopard? I have, actually. I've seen it once. I've seen two male lions leap into a very scraggly sort of knobthorn tree and steal a, an impala from a leopard that was then perched higher up where the, it knew the lions wouldn't go because they were too heavy. And they climbed up, stole the tree, and then one of them got stuck in it, and he couldn't get out. And he was sat, uh, he was sort of uh, draped in the fork. Sorry, I was quite astounding transmission on the radio there. Um, in an accent I've yet to hear, here, it was kind of boned herring at 20 fathoms. Um, and this lion got caught in the middle of, a, of the fork of the tree and he couldn't get out. And it was hilarious to watch. Eventually he did get out and he then fell to the ground. But it was a. Cats, especially the big cats, the bigger the cat is, the, I mean, it climbs incredibly competently, but getting out of a tree, the bigger the cat is, the wor worse it is at become a sort of an elegant descent. And he got stuck in the fork of the tree while his brother devoured the impala on the ground, and I think eventually when he fell down, there was nothing left. Right, we head towards Treehouse Dam where there's very little water left. There's a little bit of moisture in the soil, but otherwise, there's nothing. Now, what else can we find around this breezy morning?
Christopher, a very good question from you, and it's a very valid one, especially as we drive around here. And you see the impact that we have on the animals. And you say, are there any places in South Africa where uh, it's just wilderness, where people and, and, and cars are not allowed, and the animals in the landscape are just left to be on their own? There are a few, and most of them are in the Kruger National Park. There are big, extensive areas of the Kruger Park, sort of um, 120,000 hectares at a, at, a, at a stretch that are free of people, there are no roads in them, you can't go in there, you're not allowed to go in there, you can't drive, and the landscape is left to fend for itself. So there are a few of them here. South Africa, of course, though, has a population of 53 million souls, and so that's quite large, which means our landscape is quite heavily utilized. But if you go to a place like Botswana, which is about the third the size of South Africa, uh, and it's only got two million people living there, plus minus, you can get, find concessions of sort of 400,000 hectares where you might have a tourism operation there, but I mean its impact on the land is so negligible because 400,000 hectares is about a million acres and you know I mean you can't really do a great deal of damage with six, six vehicles out on a million acres of land. Right, well here is Treehouse Dam and we'll just get up onto the wall and then I'm going to contact Herbert and find out what he suggests we do from this position because he's got the tracks it would be very nice to spend a bit more time with Karula and her babies I know that's rather selfish of me Righty, let's see what we can see from here. Ah, the silence is marvellous. Ooh, Dyker. I saw Dyker. It's gone running off down there. I thought it was a leopard. It isn't. What a sadness. Herbert, you copy Herbert? We'll just quickly get an update from him. There'll be one treehouse dam wall. Where do you want us to check? Copy, confirm you've located. Okay, copy. We'll just drive around that block. So he's working in here and he's a little bit worried that she may have headed down south towards the boundary. So we'll head there and let's have a look there. It's, um, it's really not that cold this morning, so I'm going to take off my scarf, Brian. Oh. How many jackets are you wearing today? Uh, just the usual three. Three jackets. That's it's very warm then because Brian's simply got seven jackets on if it's really cold. Okay. Ah, Julia in Houston, I did indeed. You say, did I find out the name, the Shanghai name of the jackal, which I didn't know the other day? Uh, Julia, I did, and I found it out in two ways. One, very kindly, I'd forgotten that we actually had a blog up on Wild Earth with all the Shanghai names, and that was reminded to me by one of our viewers. And so I looked there, and then I asked Herbert, and he said he confirmed what was written there. And a jackal is Mangawana. That's what it is. That's what a side striped jackal is. At least what a blackback jackal is, Mangawana. There is a name for a side striped jackal, and there's one written there on the um, on that blog. But Herbert reckons that people just refer to jackals these days by that one word, Mangawana. Thank you very much for reminding me of that, Julia. I'm very pleased that I managed to <laughs> remember to find out. All right, we're going to ease along here. I mean, this is where we checked yesterday, and there were tracks all over the road here yesterday. I couldn't come up with anything. I don't know which side of the road they were. I suspect maybe Herbert and his vastly superior tracking skills might have a little bit more luck than I did. 
You can see the vehicle there that he's come in, just in front of us. And he will be walking through this block on foot, trying to come up with a sign of the Queen and George and Charlotte. Indeed, there he is. <laughs> Ah, hey! What's the get the tea, Kui? Lang Coven. Okay. All right. In Tajika, let us carry me. Okay. 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 All right, everybody, that's Herbert just telling us that the track's going up and down all over the place, not sure exactly uh, where they are. Um, and while we try and figure it out, let's go across to Jamie and find out what's happening with her. Isn't Herbert absolutely amazing? He is such a wonderful character. He's kept us all very entertained. Just by the way, it was actually, I don't know if James mentioned this, it was Herbert's birthday yesterday which he kept very quiet and we only just found out about it. A very special happy birthday to Herbert for yesterday and to Mama Z, who Mama Z of course takes care of us spectacularly well. She really does look after the, the entire camp, which can be something of a tricky experience I imagine for her. All right, here we go, coming up to the Cheetah Plain sign. The first thing in the morning trip to Cheetah Plains gets a bit chilly. You have to drive relatively rapidly. So just an update, I'm not sure whether James has mentioned it, but um, quarantine is still on his warthog kill. However, he has been joined, he was joined yesterday, by Mvula, which is an interesting thing. It seems as though Mvula and quarantine often share their kills. I know that most people believe Mvula to be quarantine and Kunyuma's father. Obviously, they were before my time. I still haven't seen Quarantine, um, and I've only seen Kunuma once very briefly. Quarantine always seems to turn up whenever I'm on leave. Now, see, Wade, uh, you've asked a question about Quarantine. Of course, I haven't seen him before, so the answer... Ooh, I can hear some parrots. The answer is um, something that I might turn to the other viewers for, but C. Wade would like to know how he got his name Quarantine. Now, as far as I know, he was named Quarantine because of the amount of time he spent on quarantine clearings. So that big open clearing that James was on at the start of the Sunrise Safari, which in turn was called Quarantine Clearings, due to the fact that at one point, cows, before the Sabi Sand was a nature reserve, cows were quarantined there. But if I'm wrong about that, those of you who are familiar with his name, please feel free to correct me. That's just what I've always thought about it. So while we go up and say hello to Andrew, let's go over to James and find out what he's up to. Good morning. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Or rabies. Oh, hello everybody. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. Oh well, Rusty not behaving herself. Luckily, Brian and I weren't saying anything naughty, were we, Brian? No. no, we were just discussing that we thought quarantine was not a very nice name for quarantine and how we may as well therefore call Sundile Rehab or Rabies. Um, I'm glad we haven't chosen either of those names for him. Anyway, so, so it goes. I think Q-Mail, I think everybody calls him Q, is much better than quarantine. Anyway, we're still trying to identify the other male leopard across that way. Mike says he reckons it probably is Mvula and not Tingana. Because I think Quarantine probably wouldn't have hung around if Tingana had come across him. I think he probably would have disappeared because Tingana, of course, in the prime of his life, unrelated, he thinks, to Quarantine and therefore would probably have been quite a lot more aggressive than he might have otherwise been. Now, Herbert, Herbert is a bit flummoxed by these tracks. He says they're going up and down all over the place. And as I was just saying, Jamie also thinks that it is Mvula. I think let's, let's do this. Mm, there's some very cross birds here. Brian, there's one of them. 
some very cross white crested helmet shrikes. I say they're cross because they're sort of alarm calling. Let's just keep watching them here. Isn't that a lovely shot? You can see why it's called a helmet shrike. Oh, what's it caught? Nothing. It's just shaking a tree. They all look for little caterpillars and grubs, and around this time of the year, that will be a serious boon for them. Isn't that nice? You can see why it's called a helmet shrike with that grey helmet, and indeed it used to be called a grey helmet shrike, which would make a whole lot more sense than the white crested helmet shrike, but you know how these ornithologists go. They're all on the ground there in front of us now. And there's it. He has caught something. Hop, 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 hop. Oh, I think they're such fun birds to watch these. They live in a flock, they're communal breeders. Look at that. Ah, oh, they got so cool. And it's a little bit like a wolf pack with an alpha male and female. There's a woodpecker. Very nice, Brian. Cardinal woodpecker. Female. Excellent. Let's check my identification of that bird quickly. I'm 95% sure that's what it is. You'd think that after this amount of time I'd see a cardinal woodpecker and know it on sight. Uh, you know. It is a cardinal woodpecker female, that is correct. The only other one with a plain black head is a bearded woodpecker, but she's much bigger than that. Zupa. Little what the helmet sharks are still there. Oh, this is wonderful. We don't get to see them like this, you know. This is really quite special. And I just want to find out exactly what they eat at this time of the year. Listen to them, can you hear them? It's a lovely sound. Uh, insects, spiders, and small lizards, so they will catch the odd reptile. And I think that's what you'll find when they're fossicking about at this time of the year. They're probably looking for little reptiles that are estivating. Listen to them. And in the background, you can hear a chin spot batters. I guess these swizzling calls are probably not alarm calls. They're probably far more the birds sort of keeping in contact with each other as they feed. They've no doubt got meaning to each other. To us, obviously, completely meaningless, is, unless you speak white crested helmet truck. Do you speak white crested helmet truck? No, uh, not in a long while. Not in a while, yes. One does tend to forget, mm. I find. Mm. I was just checking up also on the breeding, and they are cooperative breeders. In other words, all of this flock will help raise, but only one pair will breed, and it's a monogamous pair, and their marriage apparently lasts for about two and a half years, which I think is quite fun. <laughs> they have a marriage that lasts for two and a half years, and then they move on to another monogamous pair. They probably live for about ten years, I imagine. Um, James in Texas, you want to know about um, puff-backed shrikes and whether we get them here. We do get them. They are not, and they are still around, they are not migratory birds. Um, you'll probably find that they're sort of mild local migrants, so you'll probably find more of them on the rivers as opposed to in the general woodland like you would normally. But yes, they are certainly still around. I saw one the other day, and I heard a few of them as well. I'll show you a picture of him. He's now called the black-backed puffback. And um, of course, in typical uh, ornithological style, the black-backed puffback, the most obvious thing about the black-backed puffback, Brian, is a white back, correct? Mm. Yes. 
amazing. Just used to be called the puffback, and then some imbecilic ornithologist got hold of it and decided black-backed puffback was a much better name for something without a black back. And everybody else agreed because it was probably a bit scientific. All right, we're going to turn down south now. I'm going to do a little foray along the southern boundary, see what we can find there. Joe in Australia, nice one from you about the biggest flying bird that we normally see. Well, the biggest flying bird seen to date is in fact the biggest flying bird in the world, and that is the Cory Bustard. I haven't seen one yet on Safari Live, but they have been seen on the Arethusa airstrip as far as I'm aware. Otherwise, the biggest bird you're likely to see here is a Cape Vulture, and they weigh about 12 kilograms. And that's only about ooh, 30 pounds, it's under 30 pounds. So they really are not very big at all uh, in comparison with, say, an ostrich, which is the biggest bird in the world, and that can weigh up to 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. So heaviest flying bird, Cory Bustard, uh, up to, I've read up to 21 kilos, probably more accurately to about 18 or 19 kilograms. And uh, if you multiply that by 2.2, uh, you get roughly 40 pounds. And that's the heaviest flying bird in the world. Now apparently the heaviest flying bird in history ever used to weigh 80 kilograms. That is the size of an ostrich. Can you imagine seeing something the size of an ostrich fly overhead? Utterly terrifying. I'd definitely hide, wouldn't you, Brian? Yes. Even someone your size might not be okay. Ooh. Apparently, we are linking to a leopard. A leopard on a termite mound. And actually, one of my absolute favourite leopards. I believe, I have to have a close look, but I think we have just found Tundi on Cheetah Plains. The oldest daughter, the twin sister of Shadow and the oldest daughter of Karula the queen that James and Herbert are searching for. Hello, girl. And we actually have Andrew to thank for this because he said to me there were leopard, female leopard tracks coming up from Annette's, which is south of Cheetah Plains, towards Juma Dam. And lo and behold, here we have Tundi on a termite mound. And I'm very happy that she moved because if she hadn't moved, I wouldn't have spotted her. Hello, big girl. It's amazing, you can so see the resemblance between Tundi, Shadow and Karula. Isn't she just stunning in this morning light? She's got a very, she's either got a very full belly or she's pregnant, which is something we sort of, we spoke about before. This looks like a combination of the two. We saw her a couple of weeks ago around the Muwanini and we speculated that she might be pregnant. Um, looking at her now, she it's hard to tell. Let's just wait for her to move forward a little bit. But she has had a meal recently. That full belly is not just, if she is pregnant, it's not just cubs. Absolutely wonderful. What a nice surprise. Now for those of you who are new to Safari Live and our different leopard characters, to see a leopard perched on the top of a termite mound like this is actually a very common occurrence. That's because it provides them with a perfect vantage point and they can scope out the area before they go wandering through. The predator's eyesight is actually relatively good. She's geared towards movement, so they're attracted by movement, just like lions, which is why we always say when confronted with a leopard or a lion on foot, you absolutely never run away from them, because you trigger that instinct within them. So she's scanning, using those hypersensitive ears and nose and eyes, all in combination to see what she can find. Something's attracted her attention ever so slightly.
Isn't this just an incredible view? Here you go. The three spot pattern on her left hand side. I think, unless I'm wrong, I think Tundi's 3-3. Three, three. I, I never remember the spot patterns, to be completely honest with you. I usually just recognize the, the leopard just from looking at them and their, their general shape and face. Three, ooh, what have we got there? Three, three. And what I'm talking about is the top row of spots on their nose, their whisker spots. Oh, the fly is irritating her. And that's how they get classified. So if you look at the top there, if you count one, two, and three, just where her nose starts to curve upwards. Oh, look at that. But when she looks at you like that, you absolutely know she's, ooh, look at that belly. That looks like a pregnant belly to me too. That looks like a very pregnant belly. It's right at the back. Isn't she just glorious in this dappled morning light? What a pleasant surprise. Lovely way to start off the morning. Definitely made the chilly drive to Cheetah Plains 100% worth it. Okay, she is leading us into a tricky block that we shall, we shall endeavour to follow. Dodging the strychnos as we go, or the monkey orange as we go. Now, like all opportunist tick leopards, she could well be looking for something to hunt. I think she has recently had a meal, even though that full belly is not just based on food, I don't think. I'd love to hear your opinions as well, if you agree with us as to our assessment. Oh. She's scent marking her territory. But if you agree with our assessment as to Tundi's condition, so to speak, and whether or not she's pregnant, I'd love to hear from you, as we always do. You can send that through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or any other questions that you have, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Okay, this is why tracking Karula and her kin there's always an interesting experience because she's just changed direction completely. I'm hoping she's going to stay on this path and make life relatively easy for us. Everybody watch your heads and your arms and your various anatomical body parts. Because she's leading us through a strict nos thicket. relatively open for now. I'm just trying to find a good spot to get around her. I'm hoping she's going to lead us to a road, which would also be very useful in terms of calling us in, because I don't 100% know where I am, which is my standard approach to Cheetah Plains. I'm not very good with the road names yet. What's that tail flicking? Let's just stop and see. She might have spotted something. And there you go, you've got that perfect example of what Justin has asked, which is why leopards have that incredibly white tip on their tail. Especially because it shows up so clearly on a leopard. Look at it go, twitch, 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 twitch. So the main sort of reason behind that, the most theories suggest it's to help cubs follow their mother through the bush, kind of like a follow me sign. I'll add to that that a tail, in terms of determining a leopard's mood, the tail is one of the most important indicating factors. So a thrashing tail, those of you with domestic cats will know, the tail of your cat will give away its current mood. And a leopard is no different, so highlighting it in a colour, either black in the case of lions or white in the case of a leopard, is a useful way of them being able to use it for visual communication. 
So that's one of the big reasons. It's an interesting evolutionary thing though, because I have seen a leopard give away its position almost seemingly accidentally. It's been stalking for hours and then all of a sudden that tail that shows up so clearly gives a twitch and its position is revealed to the prey that it was stalking. And it, I could see the frustration from that leopard. Guys, I think we're going to go through quite a... No, hold on. We've got an okay position. There's lots of holes here. It's a bit... Apparently most of you... Whoopsies. Sorry, rust bucket. Most of you agreeing that this... She does look particularly pregnant. Oh, look at that. That's stunning. That little trot up the termite mound. Scouting about. On alert. Isn't she absolutely beautiful? So yes, that tip of the tail is an interesting thing. It gives the leopard's position away at times. As I said, I've seen it happen before. And often what you'll find is if a leopard's been spotted by a squirrel or a go-away bird, something that's alarm calling, what they'll often do is they'll lift up their tail and flick it, almost like raising a flag of surrender, as if to say, okay, I know you've seen me. You can stop telling everybody else that I'm here. I give in, I give up, I'll move off elsewhere. Let's just see if she decides to settle here. I don't think she's going to. And his ears constantly sort of seeking. I think she is hunting. And we're going to be very careful not to risk interfering. Oh, time for a quick scratch. Haloed in this morning light. Absolutely beautiful. You can really get an idea of just how long a leopard's whiskers really are. Not often we get to see them highlighted like this. She must be close to 10 years old at this point. I think Shadow and Tundi must be close to 10. Both of them have had relatively, I think it's just maybe because we, we compare them to their mom but both Tundi and Shadow have had relatively unsuccessful attempts at raising litters of cubs. But hopefully this time will be different for Tundi. And Aqua, you were wondering about her success rate as a mother. As far as I know, she has one adult daughter in Mala Mala. I also heard a rumor that she had a son, but I, I haven't been able to clarify that. Oh, she's very, she's moving very quickly here. So Aqua, a relatively limited success rate. It gets very thick in here. I'm going to need to concentrate just going through. Don't want to lose her in this strychnos thicket. Whoop, nearly lost an eye instead. I think she's going to lead us where we can't follow. Okay, because it is so incredibly thick here, for now I'm going to send you back across to James so I can concentrate on keeping track of her. And hopefully we'll be back with you and the leopard shortly. How very exciting to see Tundi there, and I'm amazed that um, she still looks so pregnant. I would have thought by now she'd have popped, but maybe she's just on the verge of doing so. Very exciting, and hope she'll, she'll do it somewhere where we're able to view her. And on that note, we are in this area, we're at the Arethusa driveway. You can see there by the very obvious sign that says uh, Arethusa on it, that we've come into this area because we found Shadow's tracks and her cub tracks just at the junction around about where the two main roads, the Triple M brake, that's the one we were on there, 
and the Gauri main road which you go on to Cheetah Plains where they meet and because they are such a main thoroughfare you couldn't really tell where they went but they were around here at some stage quite recently I think they're south into Hoffmans but we'll just do a little loop around here and maybe we'll be lucky to find Shadow and Zara I'll just keep an eye out on the road I think it would be very nice to see all the leopards today <coughs> Hello, Bud in North Carolina. A good question from you. You say you haven't seen or heard anybody mention the Anderson male for the last little while, and you say, is he still alive? I think he's alive and well. The reason we don't talk about him is because we don't really see him, and we haven't spent a huge amount of time on Arethusa recently. He's, his western boundary, or his eastern boundary, sorry, is the western boundary of... of um, Tingana's territory and quite conveniently for them and for our descriptions of them that is the western boundary of our traversing which means that unless he is really in the far western eastern extremities of where he operates we are not going to hear about him we're definitely not going to see him so the chances of, of us ever seeing him are very small anyway because he is largely off to the east of us okay Jamie's back with Tundi enough of my waffling let's go back and see her There's something interesting about Tundi's behavior. She just listened very intently off to the east of us and then immediately changed direction and is slinking off to the west. And I wonder what that was all about. Okay, well, time to mark territory at least, so she's not scared. Um, I think we'll go and investigate what she was looking at if we lose her. I'm really hoping we're not going to. She's coming across to a place called Juma Dam, strangely enough, all part of the intricate history of Cheetah Plains and Juma, which are interlinked. Where did she... Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> and Deborah, our armchair traveller, you wanted to know what the gestation period is for a leopard and that you've forgotten you're sorry. Please don't apologize. That's absolutely fine with us. You'll probably find that there are people out there watching that would love to know but are too shy to ask. So depending on the leopard, obviously it differs in the same way it differs for people. But depending upon the leopard, it's usually around 95 to 100 days. Even as early as... 90 days, which is around three months. Oh, goodness. She's really leading us through the worst possible spots. Now, for those of you who are new to the show and you're concerned about the trees, I'm driving over species that are considered to be... Where'd she go? Oh, there she goes. She's keeping us guessing here. Just that tip of the white tail. So I'm driving over trees that are known as encroachment species. They also pop back up very quickly. But we are sensitive to the trees that we drive over. Very, very careful not to cause the environment any damage. Okay, we're going back this way, are we? Whew. I'm glad we did that big circle. <laughs> Promise you, this is why tracking Karula is so difficult. So Paige, you talking about um, Tundi's success rate as a mum. I mentioned that I heard that she had a son, but that I was unfamiliar with his history. Apparently, she has an adult son called Bahuti. You've seen Bahuti. So that's Tundi's son, is it? She's going to do the same thing as before. Okay, let's stop. Okay, she's hunting. She spotted something and she's hunting. Oh, oh no, she's, she's now just lying. 
Ah, d'accord. What have you seen? So I need to see Bohuti now. Add him to the list of leopards that I would really like to encounter. Now, MJ, you were wondering about the quickest way to identify the sex of a leopard. There's a huge size difference in the males and the females. Even a year old cub that is a male cub is almost larger than their mother, even at a young age. But to be honest, the, probably the quickest way, have a look at their necks. The males tend to have a far thicker neck than the females do. They develop that dewlap at around five, six years old that they will then continue to grow throughout their lives. And we know with Tingana, he's basically a head and shoulders. His neck doesn't really exist. It's just pure muscle and dewlap. And then the other quick way is because you usually see almost invariably when you first spot a leopard, it's usually walking away from you. And the, the normal way is relatively clear in leopards. Their testicles are clearly visible underneath their tail. That's usually one of the, the quick, quick ways of checking if you can't quite get a sense of scale or perspective of the size of the leopard you're looking at. Behavior wise, relatively similar. settled down. I think there is something in the block. I think the reason for her sudden change of direction and looping around is she spotted something that she wants to hunt but it's now a game of patience in terms of catching it. So she's very intently watching and she's waiting for whatever it is. She obviously tried to calculate the direction that it's walking in as well as the wind direction because it is very very windy today. She might also have wanted to place herself downwind of it, which is exactly what she's done if there is something in that direction. And the wind is blowing the scent straight to her and her scent away from whatever it is. So we're going to proceed with a little bit more caution. Good morning Hayden. Hayden Turner is uh, sending us a big hello from Australia and we all miss you Hayden. We can't wait for you to come and visit us once again. You're saying you're enjoying watching this magic live from Australia. Isn't it just magical? It's the wonder of going out on a live safari and not really knowing exactly what you're going to encounter along the way. Where to next, girl? What's the plan? Slinking over the top of the termite mound. I'm hesitant for now to reposition just because I want to gauge exactly where she's looking and concentrating and what it is that she might be trying to hunt. I don't want to interfere in any way, so we'll just wait and watch and see what she does. Mm work out a lot from a leopard's behavior and their focus and where they're looking. I think she's just looking for now. Hmm. I've just heard an interesting update while we watch our gorgeous female leopard. The lion that was shouting all night last night, roaring away right next to our camp, has apparently made his way, having made himself thirsty after a night of calling, he's made his way to the Juma Pan. So for those of you who are watching the Juma Dam camera at the same time as our live safari, you'll be happy to know that James is on his way there now.
the moment we've got this extraordinary view. What's that girl? You hiding? Or just finding a comfortable spot? The difficulty is in this windy weather to try and listen. There's so many rustles everywhere. Just the tip of her tail visible there, blowing slightly in the wind. Now we spoke about the identifying features of our leopard. <laughs> We've got tip of nose and tip of tail and not much else. We will reposition in a moment. I just want to watch what she's looking at. <laughs> James, you were wondering, since there's that case of the, the lioness with a mane in Botswana, and it's happened a few times throughout history, you're wondering whether there are any recorded cases of a female leopard developing a dewlap. Not as far as I know. I mean, there, there are obviously some females that are genetically have larger necks than others, just as though there are females with large necks as it is. They're bigger than some of the other females. Salehse, for example, is larger than Karula's line of leopards. And having seen her cub, um, Tiani, for the first time a couple of weeks ago, or two weeks ago, it's definitely a much larger genetic line. That cub is absolutely enormous. She's so cool. And it's the first and only time I've ever seen her, and she really is stunning. Whereas Karula's family line is a little bit smaller, a little bit more compact, and Tandi is tiny for a little female leopard. She's also found herself a really well-hidden spot. Hey, girl, make, making life tricky. Just see if she's still focused intently. I think she's relaxed a bit, which means we can reposition. Let's try and go and find ourselves a nicer viewpoint. It's the perfect hiding place that she's found, sort of between the two mounds of the termite mound, the two vents. that one. Well, the one thing about Tundi is she's got a slightly larger personal space boundary than her mother does and then Shadow does. She likes to have the vehicles a little bit further away to feel comfortable. I think I've really tied myself in knots here. My clever plan was not so clever. Hmm, we might have to start this all again and go from the other side. Because I've found myself faced with flat tyre inevitability if I drive through here. It's just sickle bush everywhere. Okay, let's try this again. Let's go around the other way. Sorry about that. Sorry, Vim. Oh, goodness me. We found something, it's a stump of some kind. We're just going to try and get over it. <laughs> so while we attempt to negotiate this incredibly tricky position that Tundi has placed us in, or at least I've placed us in, James, you'll be happy to hear, has made his way to another one of our big cats. Go ahead. Right, everybody, look at that big lion there. I've just got to quickly call him in. Tex, male lion, junction, Wahlberg's nest, and uh, Twin Dams Road, animal static. Right, let's go around the other side of him. I think this is that uh, Birmingham boy with the sort of pathetic pom pom on the back of his tail. Yes, yes, I know. I'm sorry I said that about you. He's looking at me very angrily now because I've told him everyone that he's got a poor pom-pom. If you were to compare his pom-pom, though, with the one, for example, on Jamie's hat, um, you would be amazed at how poor it was. But now look at him in the golden light of the dawn. Hello, boy. Very spectacular there. I may even try take a photograph of you. 
please don't lie down just yet. Isn't that lovely, everyone? Beautiful male lion, and thank you for pointing him out to us. Apparently he was on the Juma Dam cam. Stunning. Oh, there's another one calling. That's why he turned his head. It went, hoo hoo. Now I believe Hayden Turner of Australia is watching us. Hayden, wonderful to have you with us. And thank you for giving us of your time, of course. And please do send through, uh, well, not so much a question. You probably can't ask anything that uh, you don't that you don't know that we don't know. If you know what I mean. Just send, send, tell us what you're doing on your. Well, you must be almost in Sunday by now. Tell us how it's going there in Australia. And also tell us when you're next going to come and see us. Because I know there are many people who'd like to know the answer to that question. Now, a very good question from someone I think called Iretus. That's an interesting name. Iretus, you say, do we call lions by the groups that they are part of rather than by individual names because they're more difficult to tell apart. And the answer is yes and no. They're not as easy as le leopards to tell apart. Um, they have obviously don't have those unique spot patterns beneath the, the nose that the leopards do. They don't have, well, unique spot patterns all over the body like the leopards do. They also roam much further, which means that they're not ever in the same area for the same amount of time as the leopards are, so we don't see them on properties the size that we operate on as frequently as we do some of the leopards. And yes, there is an, an element of us calling them by the group that they belong to because we can't identify them, obviously, but it's also because they belong to that group. Now you can absolutely tell which lion this is if you see them regularly. I am particularly poor at recognizing animals, but I guarantee you that we've got viewers who will look at him and on sight be able to identify him immediately. And I recognize him as a Birmingham boy, I think, and I stand to correction here, because of that, if you look at his tail, you can see that it's got a skinny pom-pom on the end of it. It doesn't have a sort of a large black pom-pom. So I think that's how I've identified him as one of the Birmingham boys. So please, would somebody help us out here? Somebody of our, our more regular viewers, will you help us out and tell us which Birmingham boy, or what the name of this Birmingham boy is. And they named the Birmingham boys, of course, because they come from a farm in the Timbavati called Birmingham. The Timbavati is a little bit north of this position, about 50 kilometers or so, so they're quite a long way from the pride into which they were born. And just for our new viewers, that, I mean, they're called the Birmingham boys, there are four of them, He's hearing another lion calling somewhere. He keeps looking. The four Birmingham boys were five. They come from a pride on the farm Birmingham, like I say, uh, on, in the Timbavati. One of them was killed from, or died, from the injuries sustained by a buffalo that he tried to kill. Unfortunately, he came off second best. Then these guys took over this area almost exactly a year ago. They chased out the dominant males. Um, James in Texas, you want to know how they know each other from other lions that are unrelated. James, I think very much in the same way that you know uh, who is friend and who is foe. They grew up together from tiny little cubs. They're all roughly the same age. I don't think they're all from the same litter, but they'll certainly be from two females who gave birth relatively same time. And so they know they've known each other from birth. They smell like home. Remember that animals use their sense of smell far more than do uh, our human beings. And they'll recognize each other's smells. And I also think you'll find that they will recognize uh, the look that he, each other and we also know interestingly James that lions are able to recognize each other's voices so if a lion calls from a distance 
he will be able to tell exactly who that line is. If it's an unfamiliar line, he will know that almost immediately. And John, you say this is B-boy number three. So the Birmingham boy number three, is a, or Skinny Pom Pom, I think we'll call him. What do you think, Brian? Do you think Skinny Pom Pom's a good name? I think it's quite fitting. It's quite, quite fitting, <laughs> pretty regal. But um, as I always say, I don't believe lions are the royalty out here. I think they're much more the gangsters, the mafia of the bush. So uh, Skinny Pom Pom's kind of good name for a, a member of the ruling Don's family, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah. Ooh, look. He's going to call. Was he going to yawn? Yawn. Yawn or call? <laughs> oh, sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> My interpretation of animal behavior, as you can see, everybody, superlative. He's going to call. <laughs> or sneeze. He's quite a splendid fellow, though, isn't he? Especially when he's sitting up with his golden black mane shining in the sun. So much more regal than when he's sort of lying next to a rotting buffalo carcass in a pile of his own excrement, which is unfortunately what lions do. And it has been confirmed, everybody, that the other male leopard that stole the kill from quarantine was um, was Mvula, his father. So I think that's quite nice on a number of levels. Firstly, it means that quarantine was relatively safe because he was with his dad and not with, Mvula, uh, with Tingana, who I think would have perhaps taken exception to having the young pretender in his territory. And likewise, it also says to me that Mvula is not quite as decrepit as, uh, and I use that term advisedly, knowing that it's going to create a furore on Twitter that I've described in Vula, beloved leopard that he is, as decrepit. But he's, uh, you know, he's, he's not territorial anymore, but it obviously means he's still strong enough to handle uh, a bit of competition from some youngsters, and it's clear that quarantine backed off from Mvula, so that's nice to know. He can hear something. He keeps looking up. And now he's biting a stick. <laughs> he's a lovely fellow, I must say. And, uh, you know, many of you, of course, will know the uh, the Matimba male, the, the black mane Matimba male that we called Hairy Belly for a long time, and we know that he's got a twitch in his face. He's got that sort of twitch on his left, the left side of his mouth. This chap doesn't look entirely different. He also looks like he's got a bit of a twitch. Did you see that, Brian? Mm. All right, let's head back to the leopard and find out what she's doing. I'm going to sit with this lion until he goes to sleep, which will inevitably be as soon as the sun warms him sufficiently. And welcome back. As you can see, we have managed to stay with the lovely Tundi. Um, I have to tell you something. Due to our position, my radio antenna is... Um, very much curved backwards in a blackthorn <laughs> which means I can't hear a thing that's coming from final control so for for those of you that are asking questions I'm not ignoring you um, I'm just in a little bit of a tricky spot right now there's also a considerable amount of chatter on the game drive channel we are gonna have to leave her at some point because there are other vehicles interested in joining us at the sighting. There we go, you can see how the wind is bugging her. She's still a little bit 
unsettled. <laughs> oh, Justin, you've asked a question about something to do with leopards and fur. Good morning to you. I'm afraid I have absolutely no idea what you're asking about the leopards and the fur because I can't hear you terribly well. Hold on one second. Let's see if we can't make a plan here. No. We're in a, we're in a tricky spot. Sorry, my pom-pom is getting in the way. Oh, it's nothing about animals' fur. In fact, it was what animals do they prefer? Well, Justin, it depends on the size of the leopard. It depends on the sex. So the female leopards of Tundi size will go for things anywhere ranging between Dacre, um, Steenbok, and then Impala as well, especially when the Impala are distracted in the rutting season. Um, for something larger like Tingana, he can go for things like Kudu, Warthog. Generally, female leopard try not to pick a fight with Warthogs. They do occasionally, and they're more than capable of catching them. It's just they don't want to risk any kind of injury to themselves. It's an interesting, it is an interesting thing about leopards and even more fascinating than that is the fact that they actually, individual leopards seem to have individual preferences or at least they have areas of speciality. So Tingana, for example, seems to be very good at hunting things that live in tunnels or in burrows. He very often catches warthog. I mean, we've had several warthog kills with him in the last few months. And apparently before I started working here, he also had earned a reputation as something of an artfark killer. Catching a tunneling artfark. Some leopards actually learn to be, con sort of exist off scavenging kills from other predators. They're opportunists. Very, very clever ones. Both Karula and Shadow have made a short work of a couple of male impala since they've been so distracted. And while Tandy decides which way she's going to go and I try and work out where on earth I am in order to assist others into the sighting, let's go back to James and his big cat. Now Brian and I were just saying that we think that's a very good idea that you come back here, mainly because for a lion sighting in the middle of the day, this is high action. He is now going to well, I'm not going to describe what he's going to do. I'm going to let you just watch. Because he will be around here, I suspect, for the rest of the day, somewhere around here. But he's going to go to sleep at some stage. So while that leopard is being a little bit difficult moving through the bushes, we'll watch the much more nocturnal version of the cats. Now, I have been struck over the last few months by how much the leopards move during the day, how much hunting they do during the day, versus lions, for example, which tend to be almost completely, completely asleep for most of the day. Leopards, I think, are much more diurnal than we think they are, and I think you'll find that in areas where there is pressure from um, human encroachment and from other predators, they will avoid the kind of movement of other predators. So. In this area, we know that the lions and the hyenas move around at night much more than they do during the day. I think that means that the leopards here are more diurnal than we think they are. And I also think that if you go to somewhere like the Cape, for example, we were chatting yesterday about the penguin-eating leopards of the southern Cape. And certainly a friend of mine who lives on the southern Cape coast had a leopard walk through her garden the other day. Those leopards are probably vastly more nocturnal because the number of nocturnal predators in the area are that much smaller. But the human beings, of course, are very active during the day. And I think that's why the likes of Karula and Tandi and Shadow, often you'll find their tracks moving in the daytime. He looked almost like he was going to stand up there, but I think it would become much too much effort. But <laughs> The Impala have just seen him. The Impala over there behind us, they've just spotted him. And they're deeply, deeply concerned by his presence, as so they should be. And Joey, that ties in with your question about whether or not uh, he would eat the baby buffalo from yesterday. And the answer is absolutely, 
he would devour it. And were he to come across it on his own, there would be very little that those other lion uh, buffalo could do but for that big buffalo bull that was with the baby buffalo yesterday. He would take great displeasure at viewing a lion like this. And he might chase the lion off, but easily, easily a lion like this could take a little buffalo. Do you see his claws stuck out there, Brian? <laughs> see, he's pushed his claws out. He's just cleaning in between them, biting his nails. He's probably just feeling a bit nervous. The crack of a branch off to the left-hand side of your screen indicating the presence of elephants. And the elephants, of course, if they find this fellow will be very unimpressed. Elephants are not impressed by elephants. By lions, sorry. <laughs> Kirsten, don't laugh at me. It's not funny. My lack of ability to speak. Well, we've had a rather good morning, I'd say, on the cat front, a great return. Mm, MJ, nice question from you. You say, how much venison does a lion need to eat in order to maintain his figure? Well, he is able... I'm going to work this out for you, but he is able to, ma to eat up to 20% of his body mass. Now, this lion is a pretty average sized male lion, average, small to average, and so he probably weighs in the region of 180 kilograms. Now, 20, I will work this out in pounds once I've done it in kil kilos. I'm not gonna do it all the way in kilos. 180 pounds, 20% of that is about, um, it is 35 kilograms, so you can say 80 pounds. Around about 80 pounds of meat he can eat in just about one sitting. Now that, if he ate one meal of 80 pounds of prime cut venison, MJ, I think you'd find that it would last him for at least four days before he became very hungry again. So let's say, and, and he wouldn't have to eat again, I'd say, let's say 80 kilograms, or 80, sorry, 80 pounds of venison per week plus minus. Okay? Ooh, don't know if you can hear that elephant's going, ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, the elephant's going ballistic down south of where we are now. That's the left-hand side of your screen. Look at his hair blowing in the wind, isn't that nice? Morning. No, no problem. And Deborah Armtrea Traveller, you say he's having a good hair day. I think he's having an exceptional hair day, Brian. You, have, of course, have got wonderful hair. Uh, how would you describe his hair compared with yours? A close second to mine. A close second. But magnificent, yours. nevertheless. Yes, I agree. He has much better hair than me, everybody. I don't have any hair at all. See, he keeps looking where he's been looking the whole time, and I don't know if he can hear a lion or if it's the fact that he can hear... Oh, here we go. might be that he can hear those elephants. I think he's heard something else through here. Let's see. We will follow him. It's a Birmingham boy, yeah. A little bit, yeah. He's the one they call number three. And he's got that very, um, he's got a very poor pom-pom on his tail. He's going to go straight onto the road there. This game half pops out on the road just down there. Hold on, everybody. Here we go. He's just moving through there to the right-hand side. And I'm going to assume that he's going to pop out here because to drive through this block will be a heaving nightmare. He's just over there. I'll just try and get to a position where we can view him. Like here. Shh. 
Sean in Chicago, a nice one from you. You want to know if there's an animal that hunts lions. No, Sean, the only thing that a lion is scared of is elephants and bigger male lions and perhaps a massive, massive group of hyenas. Otherwise, they are afraid of nothing. And nothing will eat them except other lions and maybe hyenas might eat them as well. It's quite a nice view of him walking through the bush there on the game path. And of course the cats, a bit like us, they like to walk where it's easy to walk, so they often use roads. There he comes. I just wonder if he's not heard something up here. Maybe there's a female in here somewhere. I just, when we first stopped and he looked up, I heard, oh, which sounded to me like another lion. It could have been the wind blowing through a particularly uh, sort of stiff piece of branch somewhere, but. Well, he'll come out. There's some clearings just up ahead of where he's walking now. You can still see him there. I'm going to wait here. There's a gap in the road here. Hmm? He did he? Brian says he sat down, everyone. He may have just had a scratch. Is he lying down? Got him. Ah, yes. Quite a nice shot. We will go in there and try and get a closer look, everyone, but just have a look there. And if you're walking through the bush, I always like to do this. If you're walking through the bush, that is the kind of thing you're looking out for. Now, our view with the naked eye um, is probably not that dissimilar to the view you have there. And you can imagine walking through the bush how easily it would be how easy it would be to go straight past a fellow like that, especially if he just ducked his head down, which is what he would do if he saw you coming by on foot. Justin, a very salient question from you. You say, have I ever been stalked by a lion? Justin, to my knowledge, I haven't, um, but then you wouldn't really know, would you? The, you do hear stories, and I mean, certainly there was a, during my training, you know, I've told you about the fact that we had to do these unarmed walks. I'm just going to try and find an easy way in here. Um, we had to do those unarmed walks where we had to walk the reserve unarmed, which may sound like an insane activity if you don't know the area very well, but it isn't. But one of the guys who was training at a reserve near where I was, he did, was doing his unarmed walks, and um, he wasn't very aware of what was going on around him, and apparently a lioness did t start to stalk him and he didn't realize and a, v a game drive came around the corner saw the lion saw him and drove him between them and he got on the car and it was fine I mean I don't think the lion was very close to him but it freaked him out completely and he left the bush two days later he wasn't able to come back and work here um, so it does happen what would have happened at the end of that story I don't know um, I'm very pleased that the game drive was there but that was the end of his career. All right, we're going to try and find what's going on here. Let's go and find out what's happening with Tandy and Jimmy. Whew. So Tandy's led us on a, a relatively merry dance, and we've actually left the sighting for now. We've pulled out of the sighting. I don't want to risk damaging the vehicle any further. I don't want to risk upsetting her at all. Um, and it just got incredibly, incredibly dense in there. Plus, there's also several other vehicles that would like to come and see her. So now that I've guided a couple of people in, it's time for us to leave. We've had our time with her, it was awesome. And I think we're done for now. Now let's go across towards the Cheetah Plains, or Plains part of Cheetah Plains, and see what we can spot there, since we're already on a roll. How's the camera doing there, Viam? Is it still in one piece? Yeah, I'm it now. <laughs> we, um, Yes, I, I nearly took my head off, I nearly took VM's head off, I nearly took the light off, the VR rig pole. Uh, we acquired a passenger at one point that was wedged under the steering bar and I'm relatively certain at some point I'm going to be changing a tyre. But other than that, all is well. 
on the back of Rusty. Whew. Just a just a couple of of leaves. <laughs> that was fun though. It was a thoroughly entertaining way to spend a morning. There's certainly never a dull moment out here. I think I'm about to bump into their sighting again, but let's try and go around and head through to Cheetah Plains. Oh, I hope Rusty's okay. Well, at least one of us has managed to keep track of their big cat sighting. Let's go back across to James and his lion. There's the line, everybody. Just excuse a bit of scratching audio. I'm changing my hat. There we go. Can you still hear me, Brian? Okay. Oh, wonderful. The lion has done what all lions do at this time of the day, and that is go fast asleep. All cats, I suspect Tundi doing the same. And just look, walking in front of him, two, <laughs> two Franklins. <laughs> they were very cross earlier. They were going... Bzzz. Yeah. <laughs> Connie, a very nice question from you, and the answer is both. You say, does prey alarm call to warn each other or to say to the predator, I've seen you? Connie, it's for both reasons. And uh, absolutely, they do it to warn each other, and they also want to say to a predator like this, uh, we see you, don't come any closer. And normally it works. You know, like a leopard or a lion, if they're spotted by impala, they normally give up on their chase. A wild dog is something completely different. And unsurprisingly, therefore, they don't alarm call at wild dogs. They just run. Another Franklin. He's hearing all sorts of things, this lion. I don't know what he's hearing. Oh, that's a nice shot. Watch me miss it. Isn't that nice? That's such a cool shot of him with his nose up to the wind. lovely. I really think that's so special. Oh, right, Tandy is back with Jamie. Let's go and look. We've just bumped into Tandy again. What wonderful luck. We're going to have one last view of her. I'm not even really meant to be in this sighting, but I accidentally found myself here. So we're just going to go forward a little bit. One last view of her before she disappears. Um, oh, there she is. Well done, Vian. And off she goes. So we won't be trying to follow her into this drainage line. I just asked them if I could join them very briefly and then come past. So our last view of Tandy, off she goes into the drainage line and towards be to leave her be for now and move off and search for other things. I just wanted to give you one last glimpse of her before she disappears. And now we've got to navigate the traffic jam that she has created. And it's nothing like a, what's, what's today, Saturday morning traffic as a result of a leopard. Definitely the best kind of traffic. So while we negotiate this current situation, back across to James and his big cat. I think this is the most stunning picture, everybody. The winter grass, the lion with his face to the rise, risen sun. Isn't he lovely? I'll tell you what, I'm seldom very satisfied by a lion sighting. They often leave me slightly cold because they're not doing anything. This chap is regally staring about his domain. The colours are all beautiful. And, of course, the wind blowing around him is making a really sort of a, not quite eerie, but expectant atmosphere. It's really lovely. Mm. 
Now, Law Anthony, you ask a very nice question about how big cats change their habits when we follow them, and do they change their habits? How do they tolerate it? Law Anthony, we don't know. We, uh, well, I mean, we do to a certain extent. We don't think they change their habits at all. But there is no question in my mind that having a vehicle moving like our vehicles do around them, especially given the noise that they make, I have no doubt in my mind that they hear us, that the noise of our vehicles and the smell of our vehicles affects their ability to know what's going on around them. But they don't seem to change their behavior much as a result of that. And I think they become very used to it. And I don't think that, uh, I mean, I don't think we affect their lives hugely. But they absolutely, uh, they become habituated to it. So initially, if you, if you see one of these lions for the first time, he'll, um, he'll be very kind of, uh, not nervous, but he'll be very weary of you and probably watch you a lot more. These days, because they've become so used to us, when you drive through the bush following them, they don't tend to react in the slightest. They just get on with it, which I think is remarkable. Hello, Kevin in Oxford in the United Kingdom. Lovely to hear from you. Thank you for getting hold of us. Kevin, you want to know why, if they are the top of the food chain, why it is that they are, um, sort of, why their numbers are decreasing? Kevin, it's simply because human beings are the great encroachers. They are the top predators in the area in which they live. So in protected areas, they're the top predators. But Kevin, um, they are by no means the top predators in the world. We are the top predators in the world. We dominate areas. And where we encroach, so these lions decrease. They cannot live in harmony with human beings, unfortunately. And so, you know, it's purely their, their, their reduction in numbers is purely a function of the fact that their habitats have been encroached on by human beings. So it's got nothing to do with disease, it's got nothing to do with um, other predators in the areas where they live. It's got purely to do with the fact that they have conflict with human beings. And there are seven billion human souls on this planet. Well, give or take um, 10 or 12 million, and, uh, or 10 or 20 million. And there are only 20,000 lions left. And so, you know, you can just imagine the sort of pressure. And at one stage, the lion was the most widely spread carnivore in the world. That certainly isn't the case anymore. And it's purely because of human beings. I think he's a lovely fellow, isn't he? I hope he looks up at us again. But I think he's probably going to do his sleeping thing now. Lions are exceptional sleepers. Much better than Brian is at sleeping. Brian's very bad at sleeping, aren't you, Brian? Yes. Well, we've been very lucky with the cats of late. And hopefully that luck will continue. Kim, a nice one from you, all the way from Miami. You say, if a lion spots a kill, would they chase after it and eat it, or would they just leave it if they were full? Um, most of these cats are completely opportunistic, which means that if the chance to kill something arises, then they will almost certainly take it. And so if something, say, an impala was to wander past here, and it was a particularly gormless version of an impala and didn't realize that there was a lion around, uh, he would jump on it, no question. Um, if it was... Uh, and the reason for that is because, you know, they, they are opportunistic. They'll take whatever they can. And uh, you hear stories, for example, of wildebeest being introduced to an area, unconditioned to lions, and they're released from uh, the holding pen or the quarantine area. Lion pride will come into the area, kill five or six of them, eat three and leave the rest. 
because they're just, you know, there's no real point, you know, or they can't eat anymore, they're unable to eat anymore. So they're completely opportunistic killers, and they'll kill as often as they possibly can. However, now let's say a buffalo walked past down the road here, and he was full. He would, I mean, he'd weigh that up. A buffalo's difficult to kill, he's not very hungry, so he probably wouldn't go for it. But if something stumbled upon him and didn't realize, yes, then he'd absolutely smash it. I think we're going to spend another three minutes or so here, and then we'll press on and see what else we can find. Because I don't think he's going to do anything further than he's done now. Hello, Felicity in New Zealand. Nice from you. You say, do they have uh, antibacterials and things in their saliva and deodorant in their saliva like domestic cats, which will help them uh, to sort of uh, keep disease free and sweet smelling? Um, Felicity, they do certainly have antibacterial things in their saliva. It's why they lick their, their sores and their injuries so profoundly all the time. Uh, when they are sore, but uh, to say deodorant I think would be to go a little bit far. Certainly a lion is a smelly creature and I've never been past one that isn't sm that doesn't smell smelly. So I don't think it deodorizes, no. Um, in the same way, <clears throat> you know, domestic cats that I know, I've always felt have smelt quite catty and um, especially as they get, to get a bit older. So, Felicity, yes, many of the same kinds of properties that the saliva of domestic cats have. Deodorant, not so much, but I would say certainly antibacterials. And I think that they clean themselves so fastidiously of, of blood. Lions less so than leopards and cheetah, but they clean themselves so fastidiously after they've eaten, after they've killed, because, of course, the chances of getting a disease if you're covered in gore, are very high. So you can get quite sick if you're covered in muck. <laughs> and Suzanne, nice one from you in Australia. You say, what's the average sleeping time of a lion in the daytime, you know, up to 20 hours. It really is astounding how long these chaps can sleep. I don't think it's always 20 hours, but it can be up to 20 hours, certainly, Suzanne. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a long time. That's most of the day, isn't it, Brian? Mm. I don't even know many people who can sleep. I do know a few people who can sleep for that long, but not many. And, I mean, it also depends on what he's doing. Is he hungry? Is he marking territory? What's he doing with his life? And at the moment, this fellow, he looks pretty well fed, but he hasn't just eaten. And he's probably, why, why, you know, they're often alone, these Birmingham traps. It's normally two of them together always, and then one and one. Sometimes all four together, but very seldom these days. And so he was probably one of those two loners. And this is the sort of territorial march that we've caught him at the end of. I heard a male lion calling this morning. Maybe it was him. And he's now come to the end of his territorial march. And he's going to snooze here, I think, for much of the rest of the day. Right. Shall we press on from here? I think while we are waiting to see what happens here. Uh, well, we're not going to wait, we're going to press on. Jamie's found something rather more interesting to show you. Oh, we've got a lovely sighting of a couple of huge bulls around three in a row pan. Because it's so windy, I'm just keeping some distance between us. It's, we're not going to keep it that way. I'm just waiting for our big must bull to move out into the road and then we'll go and catch up with them. I've just noticed something on our bonnet. I've only just seen it now. Can you, Vim, can you get the little tracks on the, on the bonnet there? Let me try and move my head. <laughs> Look at that. 
<laughs> Something came bouncing through in the dust last night. It's a squirrel. Those three, three little tracks, or three little toes, all close together in the front of the track. It's a little squirrel track. You can see where it slipped slightly in the dust. How cool is that? Somebody has been paying us a visit. Tiny, tiny little tracks. They're probably about this big. They steal the apples, we leave them apart. Ah, after, after Vim's breakfast snacks. Whoopsie. Okay, let's go catch up with something a little bit larger than our squirrels that steal apples from the cars. <laughs> you can't see it from where you are, but I can actually see where it, it stopped and turned and jumped from the tracks where it slipped, its feet have slipped on the, on the dust. And a very good morning to Nelson, who is one of our newer viewers, and was wondering about how close we can get to the animals without feeling threatened. It depends on the animal, it depends on the individual, and it depends on their mood at that particular time of day. So what we're doing constantly is a sort of an observation of their body language. So I know as soon as we started the car, the big must bull who's been walking behind the other elephants stopped and gave us that backward glance over his shoulder. So immediately that tells me that he wants a little bit of extra space. Now, on a day like today, it's incredibly windy, which always unsettles everything else out here. So you give them a bit more space than you would on a normal day, on a still day. But that being said, he's thirsty. His desire for water is, has sort of is the predominant thing that's dictating his behavior. And if we stop, we're just going to stop here. We're going to watch them from here because if I go around to the other side, then I'm not going to have any kind of an escape route if he does decide to get upset with us. That being said, Nelson, each and every single one of these animals has grown up from very, very young with the presence of safari vehicles. So they're all, we're fortunate in that they're all incredibly habituated to us. And whilst we certainly interact with them on some level, there's no way that we can claim that we don't have an impact on the animal, that they don't acknowledge us or see us, there's nothing out here that wants to hurt us or attack us. It's just a matter of reading their behavior and being as respectful as possible. Now the elephant is the undisputed, especially a big bull elephant like the ones we've got in front of us, undisputed kings of our jungle. And it's important that we treat them as such. Natasha, you were wondering if the um, elephants, like kind of like horses, can sense whether or not you are afraid. Yes, I'm absolutely certain that they do. Um, and particularly with, with bull elephants, it's not really a message that you want to send to them because the male elephants can be quite, quite keen on asserting their dominance at times. So you don't really want to, to provoke them in any way. Um, I feel that they, they read fear. I think most of the time it doesn't bother them. But it is an important aspect of, your, of the way in which you handle sightings. And sometimes we get bull elephants that are very curious and that want to come right up to the car and have, an, have a good sniff, maybe even at times touch the vehicle. And I, it's a personal preference. I never let them touch our vehicles. But it's very important in those situations to make sure that you maintain control. The worst thing that can ever happen in the bush is that somebody panics. And that's one of the reasons why I don't let elephants touch the vehicle, because I know Viam. I know that he has nerves of steel and he is absolutely knows what he's doing in the bush. But if you have a vehicle full of passengers, some of whom have never seen an elephant before, having an elephant right up close, speaking from experience, does bring home just how large they really are. And people's res you, can't, you can't predict people's responses. You can predict an elephant's behavior, but you cannot predict what the people on the vehicle are going to do. So I don't want the elephants learning that it's okay to touch the vehicles because it might not be my vehicle next time. It might be someone with a vehicle full of people who've never experienced an elephant before. And a scream at the wrong time or a sneeze is definitely going to have a negative impact. You guys can hear just how windy it is. We're downwind of the elephants at the moment and the wind is just howling across this open area. Ooh, it's actually a little bit unpleasant. I don't, I don't really like, I'm not a wind person. It unsettles me for some reason. And I know I'm not the only person that feels that way. Okay, 
now that they've moved off a little bit and they seem to be distracted by each other, we can sneak a little bit closer. Now we've got a group of males here at the moment. And a good morning to Tammy in New Zealand while we attempt to hide and shelter ourselves from this incredible howling wind. I'm trying to keep my cap on my head. You want to know if it's more common to find elephants in big groups or little groups. Depends on where you are, depends on the time of year. So yesterday we saw a herd or several herds all joined together. It was probably about 50 if not more elephants in that area. And that's relatively common where they're, they're sort of coming together around a, a water source. There's not all that much water at the moment in the Sabi Sand or in the Greater Kruger Park area. So the herds get a little bit larger. But then in Botswana or in Zambia, you might see herds of 100, 200 elephants moving through an area. It's very, it's very area dependent, it's very seasonally dependent and rainfall dependent. Oh, having a lovely last, one last trunk full of water before they move off. And the breeding herds are, consist of females and their offspring and the occasional attendant male. But when you see bachelor herds like this, they will invariably be much smaller than your average breeding herd. So bull elephants come together for a little bit of company, maybe a bit of practice sparring, and then they move off on their own. So a bachelor herd of elephants is a very fluid thing. They come together and then move apart. And these guys are moving off. I've just got a full whiff of elephant bull coming into must. The largest of them is just, I think, either just entering or just leaving his must cycle. That time of a male elephant, every couple of months they go into must, M-U-S-T-H, where their testosterone levels go through the roof and they get a little bit antsy, let's put it that way. Oh, and we're about to accidentally interrupt somebody's drink stop, which is definitely not what I intended to do. I think we'll change our direction. We'll watch our Ellie's move off and then we'll change our plans. It's wonderful to see three in a row pan once again with a little bit of water, actually quite a lot of water. Well, they've had a thoroughly enjoyable coffee stop. They've had elephants come and join them. And while our Ellie's wander off, yesterday we retreated to a wonderful sighting of a e full-grown elephant lying completely flat. But Caleb, good morning, you wanted to know what you're trumpeting at, Ellie's. What was that all about? Oh, there's a breeding herd off a little bit further. We must have just missed a breeding herd coming through here. We're not going to try and follow them. They sound upset and it is very, very windy. Sorry, Caleb. I'm just watching what's happening with the drink stop. It's <laughs> packing up very fast because there's a whole load of elephants coming behind them. <laughs> you can't really see them behind the trees. There you go. You can see them packing up. All the guests back on the vehicle in a hurry. Happens. Sometimes you're just having a, a coffee, casual coffee stop and something wanders through. I've had lions wander through, elephants, rhino. I think let's, let's give them some space and move around. So Caleb, yes, elephants will sleep lying down, even full-grown elephants, but they won't sleep as long as the babies do. So babies can lie down for up to an hour at a time and have a long nap, rest up during the sort of period of their life where they're doing all of their growth. The adult elephants often will lie on a termite mound or against a tree just to make getting up a little bit easier. Um, and it's more common to see them sleeping standing up. What, they, what you'll often see on quarantine, or what we've often seen on quarantine, is big males. They walk up to a marula tree, flop their trunk over their tusks, and they just put their heads on the tree, just sort of rest it there and have a quick, a quick doze. One of my favorite things to see is a sleeping elephant. And they, it generally is dozing. It's, it's not really a heavy sleep for the adult elephants. That being said, I've accidentally walked in on a, a bull elephant that was fast asleep. He never knew I was there. From the moment I saw him, he was probably about 20 meters away in thick vegetation. And I just stood and watched him sleeping. He was snoring slightly before I moved off. He had no idea. Didn't even stir. So 
while we circumnavigate the drink stop and head across to the plains of Cheetah Plains, let's find out what Mr. Henry is up to. Well, we haven't found anything else, everybody. We did sit with that lion for another five minutes or so. He did stand up briefly. We thought there was going to be action, but I turned on. It was Brian adjusting his, uh, adjusting his hat. And so the lion then sat down when he realized that there wasn't going to be any action. And so that's all that's going on with him. We're now going to go towards Buffelshook Dam. The heat is starting to build, and I think that is a relative term. It's certainly not getting hot but it's getting rather pleasant, so maybe some elephants and some buffalo or something else going to come down to drink at Bivosuk Dam. We also don't know where Tingana is at this stage. There were those male leopard tracks, everyone, around Bivosuk days ago definitely with a territorial marking and so maybe he's around there there's a zebra here and a I suspect quite strongly the same ones that Jamie saw very early on this morning in the same place So the thing is this amazing sort of clearing where there's no grass anymore. And the closer you get to the Juma Dam pan, which is where there is water, the more sparse the grass is going to get because these animals, of course, will eat as close to the water. And so as the dry season progresses, you can see these absolute dust bowls. hear the wind coming up now it's a big southeasterly now the wind has switched to the southeast and that's the standard direction from which our cold fronts come so I think we're probably in for a cold front sometime this weekend All right, we should be okay now. Shamrock, um, we haven't heard from you for a while. Welcome back, lovely to hear from you. Um, you say, do I think that the habituation of animals is going to uh, change the way in which they adapt from an evolutionary perspective to conditions around here? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think it's going to make any difference. Remember that um, I mean, there are various debates as to how quickly evolution can happen, but what is uh, what isn't up for dispute is that it doesn't happen sort of within a couple of hundred years. And so I really don't, you know, it's much too soon to say what effect we would have from a natural selective point of view out here. I mean, if animals were to become, let's say, for example, let's pretend that there was a pride of lions that uh, developed the ability, and I don't mean learned the ability, they had a random genetic mutation that made them use vehicles as ways to hide from potential prey species. So let's say that lion, some lion one day was born uh, with the innate ability to get behind a vehicle and he realized well, that he could use a car to sneak up on animals because if he walked behind the car they couldn't see him, they couldn't smell him and they couldn't hear him, well then yes, that kind of gene would then be perpetuated for, sh for certain. But I really don't think that something like that is going to happen. I might be wrong, but unless, you know, only thousands of years will tell us. There's a very strong wind blowing, Brian. No, Good grief. Don't get, don't fall off the back. A 
Akwa, I think I've heard your question correctly, but it is blowing up a stiff gale out here. You say which animal were to go extinct would affect tourism the most in the Sabi Sands. Is that correct, Kirsten? Aqua, uh, unquestionably the leopard. The leopard is uh, the species that drives tourism to this area, I think, more than any other. And it is the animal for which the Sabi sand has become most popularly known. And so I think, you know, if you come to the Sabi sand, people in the, in the know uh, realize that that's what they're going to see. They hope to come and take photographs of leopards. Yes, they hope to see everything else as well, but a leopard is the real highlight. So that, to me, would by far and away outweigh any other sort of extinction. I'm not sure why that is the case. I mean, they are magnificent, but I'm not sure why, as human beings, we've ascribed so much more value to something like a leopard than we have to a humble scrub hare, for example. Now, the last time I came past here, we found a scrub hare. And it was in the night, and I felt like the thing had just popped out of it. Oh, no. Jamie with zebra. We seem to have some very upset animals here on the open area of Cheetah Plains, right next to their pan. And that's just because the wind is howling. The elephants are upset, and I think they've probably been chasing the zebra around as well. But it does give you a nice idea as to the way in which a dynamic of a, a zebra herd functions. So there's our stallion looking off, assuming a very protective role to look after his harem. And then the rest of the females bunching together, a couple of youngish foals. And I think they've deliberately chosen this open area. They have to kind of toss up between being bearing the full brunt of an icy wind and also being able to see across large distances. So the zebra know that they could outrun pretty much as long as they've got a good run up, as long as they've got a good lead, they can outrun pretty much every single predator that's out here. Uh, they seem to have decided that the most sensible approach is to stay out in the open and see what they can find. Sorry guys, I think Andrew's trying to call me. Just bear with me one second. Uh, Andrew, sorry, you're trying to call me? Ah, negative. Just a couple of, couple of love and love around between three in a row pan and cheetah pan. Andrew, where did you leave Tundi? Copy that, thank you. Sorry guys, just chatting, double checking what where Andrew left Tundi. He stayed with her a little bit longer than we did. It seems as though she's disappeared into the drainage line around the dam called Juma Dam. Possibly, quite possibly, looking for somewhere to have her cubs. Kind of like Karula did. Karula did a lot of scoping out before she actually went and gave birth. Now apart from our breeding herd, or the harem of that stallion, we've also got three stallions standing off a little bit away away from the herd, wanting to go and have a drink. And also just generally feeling the effects of the wind. You can see it in their body language just how unsettled they are. Some constant turning of the ears, jumpy movements, jerky movements. Yo, oh, this is intense. Liam, we don't even need to start the car. If we play our cards right, I'll just spread my jacket out and we can sail home. Put it in neutral and sail home. But go, go away, Hood. Ah, I'm gonna go seek refuge. And while I do, James has found one of our other antelope species. Everybody, look at the pretty colours there, the kudu in the woodland. I think it's very pretty indeed. And the kudu are not alone, of course, are they, Brian? No. no. Who is their friend, Brian? The impala. Yes, Ian the impala. Could you show us Ian? 
was in behind a bushel. Hmm. Let us go forward so that we might view Ian as well. <laughs> this is a horrendous name for an impala. Ian the impala. There he is. Hello, Ian. Ian is with the impala, or at least with the kudu, of course, because he lacks a herd of his own, uh, probably owing to the fact that he has a personality roughly like mine, which means that his own kind do not want to be around him. And so he has sought the refuge of the kudu herd. They will provide him with ears and eyes and nose that a herd of impala might have as well. This is actually really quite fun, because normally what you find is a bull of, say, wildebeest or a buffalo bull or something like that lurking with impala for exactly the same reason. It's very seldom that you find an impala ram lurking around with a herd of other animals. And they're getting on very peaceably. You see they're not cross with each other at all. Completely happy and comfortable in each other's presence. Look, Brian. I just found my lens cap, everybody. You'll be all relieved to know I didn't, couldn't find it, and I know that all of you were dreadfully, dreadfully worried. But thank you for your concern. I found it now. Look at the wind blowing, light copper colours and greens and yellows and burnt out white sky because of the wind. Who would be a kudu today? Not ideal if you're living in thick bush trying to eat leaves. This is really quite a good sighting, I must say. Hello, Kathy. You want to know if we get sable in this area. Kathy, we don't. Um, well, um, we do sometimes, very seldom. There was one scene last year knocking about on the Juma Dam wall. He was caught on the camera. And then they have seen one around in Koro and Torchwood and Kruger. They share a boundary. And that corner that is their boundary, it's known as Kudu Corner, uh, is uh, an area where sable have been seen once or twice in the last uh, couple of, in the last year. So it's highly unlikely that you're going to see sable here. But it's not impossible. I think they're my favorite too, Kathy, so I'd really like to see one as well. Really, that wind is it's really now quite intimidatingly powerful. Hello, Aqua. A very philosophical question here as we watch the wind stream across the woodland. You say, what is my greatest conservation or ecology concern? Um, aqua, for this area, it would be the provision of artificial water, which I think is having a, a detrimental effect on the landscape. Do I think it's going to have a long-term, you know, dreadful effect on this area? Uh, no, I don't, because I think humans will be gone from here in a couple of hundred years and the land use will have changed so much that it won't really matter. It, worldwide, I think it has to be the growth of human population and our astounding uh, need to consume and consume and the way that we've set ourselves up economically uh, such that our economy would collapse unless we increased consumption. We hear this constant refrain of economic growth and how we have to have economic growth and I would say that economic growth to quote I think is it's it was E.O. Wilson the great American ecologist I think E.O. Wilson said that economic growth was the greatest threat to the world's environment and I would have to agree with him I've no doubt there are th thousands who would say that's absolute nonsense but you know unfortunately with economic growth comes increased consumption and increased consumption uh, brings with it inevitably greater strains on our natural world. Right, that was a wonderful antelope sighting with a beautiful question. Thank you very much for that question, Aqua.
We're going to ease our way towards Biffles Hook Dam now. See what's there. And I'm just going to let Kirsten know. Oh, here we go. Let's go across to Jamie now. We're going to lose signal again here. Let's see what she's doing on Cheetah Plains. Here's a word of advice. The plains on Cheetah Plains is not really the place to be on a windy day. <laughs> I'm about to be blown away. I can't really hear anything. Um, I definitely can't really see anything. And all in all, it makes for a rather tricky guiding experience. Although I've just been told by, by one of the Chitwa guides that there are bush babies in a tree. So we'll probably go and have a look at them once we've checked the boundary for any of the cheetah that might be here. Those cheetah brothers that we often see. And welcome to Sarah in Australia on our windy, windy day. You were wondering whether or not it's very dry where we are. The answer is yes, it is completely dry, apart from a couple of the dams that are pumped from underground water. So through human intervention to put a little bit of water into the area. It is, we are in the grips of probably what's been labeled as the worst drought in the last hundred or so years. Um, so it really is severely lacking in water. There's absolutely no grass. I was thinking about the fact that a year ago when I started working on Juma, Twin Dams was full, Treehouse Dam was full. So this is the same time of year. Those, those dams are now completely empty. It's only Buffelshook Dam that's got a little bit of water and that's already on its way out. So the water that we just saw earlier with the elephants around them, that's pumped up from underneath the ground. Very, very dry. So for animals, the zebra are having a bit of a fight. So for the animals, particularly the herbivores, times are tough. For the predators, they, it doesn't really get better for them. There's, the animals are forced around limited water supplies, limited food supplies. So basically, if a pride of lion wants to, can hang about around a water hole and essentially just wait for the prey to come to them. I'm trying to sort of hide my microphone in my jersey so it doesn't sound so terrible. And while we're looking at our zebbies, these are birchels, or as they are now known, plains zebra, the only species that we get in this area. But MJ is asking about the difference between our zebra and the mountain zebra. Oh, there's going to be another, is there going to be another fight? Shame, these animals are so stressed. Stampede. As soon as one of them panics, they all go just in case, you know, it doesn't really pay not to, if, if, one, if one zebra catches wind of something, it doesn't pay to ignore it. Oh, now we're going back the other way, back the other way, everybody back the other way. Shame. It's very stressful being a zebra. Sorry, MJ. Difference between our plain zebra or our virtual zebra and the mountain zebra of the Cape area. The mountain zebra, of course, being far more, this is so unpleasant, far more endangered than our plain zebra. The biggest difference, or the most obvious difference, is the, the, the mountain zebra have black and white stripes. It's perfectly clear where the division is. In our plains or our virtual zebra there's a thin stripe known as a shadow stripe particularly around the rump. It's kind of like a, a, a brownish stripe in between the two black ones. That's one of the big differences. The other is that the stripes do not extend all the way down to the middle of the stomach in a mountain zebra whereas in a plain zebra the stripes go right down. Right I've had it I'm gone. <laughs> it's time for us to go. I feel like I'm about to blow away. Let's just have one quick look at our zebra with our stripes. <laughs> have a look carefully as they pass behind the trees and you'll see what I mean about the shadow stripes between the black stripes and the stripes on the belly going all the way down and meeting in the middle. So in a mountain zebra they don't have those shadow stripes, those thin stripes, and they stop, their stripes stop at sort of their chest or at their ribs. No! <laughs> 
Oh gosh, I don't even think there's any point to wearing it. Let's just, let's just go. I have to start the car first, that's how driving works. Oh goodness. Well, this wind is actually not that unusual for this time of year. But Greg in Michigan, where I believe you do get the odd snowfall, I believe, <laughs> you were wondering whether or not we ever get snow here. We don't. We're actually kept relatively sheltered from by the, the ring of the Drakensberg Mountains. So the low felt, it hardly ever snows. South Africa does get snow. So the eastern Cape area, the Natal area, up in the Drakensberg Mountains, they get a great deal of snow during winter. We even have a, a seasonal, couple of seasonal ski resorts known as Tiffendale around the Rhodes area. So the mountains close to Lesotho. Oh, yes, they get snow, but we definitely don't. If it snows in the low felt, then we have a major climate problem on our hands. And even Johannesburg has had a couple of inches of snow over the last few years, up in the high, what we call the high felt as opposed to the low felt. So Johannesburg is one of the highest, highest in terms of altitude cities in the world. Let's go see these bush babies. I want to see where they are, hiding in this tree somewhere. Oh, there. That's not a bush baby, that's a squirrel. Am I completely mad? No, that's a squirrel. <laughs> it's um, it's in the, <laughs> the top of the tree. Sorry, that doesn't really help you. You got it. That's definitely not a bush baby, that's a squirrel. Uh, there he is, up to the right. In the right hand corner. There he is, clinging on for dear life. No, that's definitely not a bush baby. <laughs> I'm a guide and I know these things. <laughs> Let's just see, they might. This is the tree that we were told the bush babies are in. Shames, clinging on for dear life, trying to shelter from the wind. Poor thing. I know the feeling, little squirrel. Hmm. I was reliably informed that there are bush babies in this tree somewhere. They might have blown away though. They're so fluffy they might just have blown up into the air. Okay. Vim, do you see a bush baby? I don't see a bush baby either. I'm going somewhere that's less open. I'm try and put my hat back on my head. Okay, let's go and get back to somewhere a bit more sheltered because this is getting ridiculous. While we drive along past Cheetah Plains, one of the last times I saw Tundi was outside one of the guest's rooms where she had killed a baby bushbuck. Now Miss, you were wondering about that, whether or not any of the animals come close to or right up to a guest room at the lodges or into the lodges. Yes, all the time. Karula famously at one point denned her cubs underneath the deck of one of the guest rooms at Voyatella on Juma, a place where you could quite happily book a holiday and stay at. The elephants come through on a regular basis. A lot of lodges have a, have a fence or an elephant wire, but it doesn't always stop them. It's important to remember out here that, that fences are not, um, they're not a guarantee for any animal. Any animal can get past a fence if they want to, if they choose to. Leopards particularly just hop over. Nyala and warthog tend to be the general game species that like to inhabit lodges and you very often also get bush babies and genets that move in and take advantage. And then of course there's the more um, difficult to, to manage and to deal with. No, it's actually not that difficult to manage, but once it's happened it's difficult. And that's monkeys and baboons. So they can become very naughty and they do start to wander about lodges 
And that's usually if the dustbins and food are not properly looked after and packed away every evening and during the day. So if they find that they have access to food, they learn very quickly that that is the way forward. And that, of course, is one of the big reasons behind the tragic situation that occurred in the Kruger National Park recently. And an important reminder, what we were saying about fences, a fence does not keep an animal out, particularly a hyena. And one poor young boy in the crocodile bridge camp found that out to his peril. And that's because people feed, guests come to the, to the Kruger Park lodges and they throw bones from their barbecues or their brides, as we call them in South Africa, to the animals outside because it's wonderful to see a hyena right up close to the fence. And hyenas are smart, just like every animal. They learn that that is the way to, that's where they must go to find food. But yes, animals do come through. We've got a whole range of species of birds that come and visit us. Nyala, bushbuck. And that for me is one of the best things about working out here. When you can wake up in the morning, look out of your window and see an elephant quietly feeding. Viem's had two bushbuck living outside his room for a considerable period of time. And an elephant, apparently. A very interesting.